Okay, this is our first lecture, and I've chosen to use Paul Hewitt's uh, lecture slides. I really think he's done a good job. He draws a lot of pictures. Um, I like it a lot. So we'll, uh, we'll use this in our class, uh, along with all of the material from your book. The first guy we need to talk about is Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander the Great, so he was one of the great Greek philosophers of antiquity, and he was so influential on hundreds and hundreds of years of people after him because the books that he wrote were considered to be authoritative. Everybody would say, you know, Aristotle is so smart he couldn't make a mistake. He made so many mistakes. Uh, he was really smart, but he didn't really go about science the way scientists go about science. He didn't do an, conduct an experiment and then uh, look to be what happened, make measurements, and then do it again and again until you come with some idea of what's going on. He simply thought about it. And so to him, things that were very logical, very, uh, very obvious, um, he simply said these things are true and they were accepted for ages. So when he wrote on uh, motion, he had this concept that everything had a proper motion. So for instance, if you had um, fire, fire would always um, go up, okay? It was just the way fire did. Rocks would always fall down. That's just what rocks did. So there was a motion inherent in the substance, and according to the Greeks, there were four substances, earth, water, air, and fire. And then your job um, as an observer of nature was simply to, to look and say, what kind of substance is this? Uh, if it's fire, it must go up. If it's rocks, it must go down. And so if you had something like a, a bird that would go up, a bird must have fire somehow in it. Okay, if you had uh, rain that went down, then there must be some earth in there, and that's how they determine things. Of course, that wasn't scientifically studied, and that's why it's all a bit big um, mishmash. So they had two types of motion. You had violent motion where something makes something else happen. So the wind pushes a boat, or, uh, or the wind, um, you know, or the, or the rain, comes down on you and, and gets you wet or something like that. So you had violent motion where one thing made something else happen and then you had natural motion. And this is where rocks always fall down or um, fire always goes up. Okay, so that, that's its nature. That's how it, it moves by its nature. Anything outside of the earth was considered the heavens and the heavens worked mathematically. Everything was perfect mathematical combinations and so circles, circles, circles. According to the Greeks, everything in the heavens moved in orbs or globes or circular motion. So about 1400 years later, okay, so you had now Aristotle in the 1500s in Italy he was just daring enough to say Aristotle might be wrong. And people were like, how is that possible? How could Aristotle be wrong? He's smart, we learn about him. Um, and he said, well, he's not dumb. Maybe he's wrong. You can be wrong without being dumb. And so he, tried, he read in Aristotle's book that a big object would hit the ground faster than a small object if you threw it from the same distance, okay? So Galileo just said, okay. And he went up to the top of a tower, the Pisa Tower, that's still leaning now. It hasn't actually fallen over yet. And it was leaning in the 1500s. And he threw a big cannonball and a small cannonball, uh, launched at the same time. And to everyone's amazement, it hit the ground at the same time. Okay, so you're, you now have this idea that experimentation is the way you figure out about truth not just uh, conceptualization or philosophy. Uh, that's not the only way of finding out truth. So he discovered that these different weights would hit the ground at the same time, and so a moving object doesn't need a force uh, to keep it moving if there were no friction. So for instance, you could roll a ball across the floor and eventually it's gonna stop there must be a force opposing it. That was his idea. 
if there was no force at all opposing it, it would keep going forever. So that is the conception that all of us hold now. It, it makes perfect sense and it, it's tested a thousand million thousand ways. So for instance, if you were in space where there's no air and you threw a hammer, you could throw it, I don't know how fast you could throw a hammer, but you, whatever, whatever speed it leaves your hand, it'll never slow down. And it'll always go in a straight line forever until it comes into some kind of a gravity field from a star or a planet or something. So, so if there's no opposition, it keeps moving. The only reason something slows down is that there is another force acting in reverse. So we define a force as a push or a pull. So if you drop something, there must be a force pulling it. Uh, we are going to call that gravity. If it slows down, there must be a force slowing it down. Often that's friction. So we'll look at all of these mo motions of objects as an interplay between uh, between the, the idea of pulling something and then keeping it from moving. So an opposition to a force. The other thing that's interesting is inertia. Now the reason why Aristotle and everybody else thinks that a big object is going to uh, fall faster is because if you have any idea of gravity, gravity pulls on a mass. And the bigger the mass, the more pull that it will exert. The reason why that the two objects uh, fall at the same rate and actually hit the ground at the same time. Now the two cannonballs were pretty cool because if I would have dropped a feather and a cannonball, the feather would stay in the air because it's catching the wind as it falls. Uh, the cannonballs are both the same shape and it goes th cuts through the wind pretty much equally. Uh, on the moon, the, the Apollo astronauts dropped a hammer and a feather and they hit the moon at the same time because there's no air on the moon to slow it down. So the reason why that the higher mass doesn't being grabbed by the earth doesn't accelerate more is because of inertia and inertia is Galileo's idea. Inertia is the idea that a something that has mass doesn't like to change what it's doing. Okay, it's lazy. So if it's moving, it doesn't want to stop moving. Okay, so if I throw a ping pong ball at you, you can catch it. If I throw a baseball at you, you probably catch it. If I throw a bowling ball at you, you probably should run. It's the idea that the more mass it has, the harder it is to start mo motion because it wants to keep stopped. But once it's moving, the harder it is to stop it. Okay, now we're going to see this idea is embedded in Newton's first law, and that's an object in motion stays in motion. An object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by another force. And the reason why is because everything that has mass has inertia. And if I'm bigger than you, I have more inertia than you, then it's harder to throw me than it is to throw you. So he built lots and lots of marble ramps. This man built ramps, ramps, ramps. He had so many marble ramps and he loved it. And his study of marbles essentially was a study of gravity. He was studying gravity. Now Newton later, a couple hundred years later, is going to do all the math and write the book. But Galileo thought the thoughts at the first, at least uh, the first one to write about thinking about it. So if you were to drop a marble, it's going to start speeding up. If you make the, the slant of that sl the slope less, it'll still speed up, but it'll, it'll speed up slower. If you make it steeper, it'll speed up faster. So the, the amount of gravity pulling has to do with the, the tilt of the, the ramp. So if you take a, mar a marble and you throw it up a ramp, then it's going to slow down the same amount that it would speed up if you dropped it down the ramp. Okay, so there's something related. The ramps are related to each other. His conclusion was, is if you were to, if it's gonna slow down going up, and speed up going down, then it shouldn't ever move if it goes sideways. So you should be able to roll the ball and for it'll roll forever with no change in speed if there was a frictionless surface. So this idea of friction, something opposing motion, is something we're going to look at. So we get to Newton's first law of motion. Now Newton was an English fella. Uh, in the 1600s, so about 100, 120 years later after Galileo. 
and he came, uh, he embedded Galileo's idea of inertia into his first law. Every object continues in a state of rest or at uniform speed in a straight line unless acted upon by a non-zero net force. You may have learned this already. An object in motion stays in motion. An object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an external force. So that brings us to the idea of net force. Let's say that we're, we're arm wrestling, okay? And I'm pushing down with all I got and you're pushing down with all you have and you've got more than me okay you're gonna win the game but that doesn't mean that I didn't push you just pushed some or a lot or a little harder than I did that's why you won so if you if you say push with 10 newtons of force and I push with 8 newtons of force really I just think of it as the 8 eats away 8 of the other Eight going west is eating away eight going east. And then if you started with 10, you've got two left over. It's the same as two going west. Okay, so the, the smaller amount of force gets, uh, gets exhausted, and then whatever's left over is called the net force. So a net force um, going left doesn't mean that there was only one force going left. There could have been 50 forces all pushing in different directions, but they canceled each other out, and whatever was left is called a net force. And a net force is always going to be in one direction um, at a certain amount of force. So let's look at some examples. If you and I both push on a box with five newtons of force, and a newton is a unit of force we'll talk about later, it would be the same as if you pushed on that box with 10 newtons, okay? Both of us will add, as long as we're pushing in the same direction. If you push in one direction and I push in one direction or we pull in opposite directions, then we're gonna cancel out those forces and it would be as if that wasn't moving. Imagine a tug of war rope where the two teams are equally matched, one pulling one way, the other pulling other. The rope knot doesn't move if the forces cancel out. So here is the equilibrium rule. It's derived from Newton's laws and says if an object is not uh, accelerating, then it must be uh, zero uh, net force. If there's any force at all on an object, it's going to accelerate. Okay, so for instance, if there's no other forces at all and I have a net force in one direction, it's going to accelerate that object. Imagine a ball in your hand and you are pushing your arm harder and harder and harder. The ball in your hand is accelerating from left to right as your hand moves it, okay? Because the force you're putting on the ball is not zero. And since it's in one direction, you're gonna accelerate the ball. So this idea is as long as everything is not accelerating, then it must be in equilibrium. And equilibrium means everything is balanced. Whatever forces are going up, are balanced with all, whatever forces are going down. So here's the painters on the sign. You've got ropes pulling up. You've got gravity pulling on the masses going down. The board weighs something. Both painters weigh something. And they're all pulling down. Everything is balanced as long as it's not accelerating. If it's accelerating, then you know that there is a net force. Okay, you've got a man holding a bag of flour and he's weighing it. Is the flower accelerating? No. If the, ba if the bag is just suspended there, then it's not accelerating. That means the forces are balanced. Well, there is a force of weight, okay? That bag weighs five pounds, and so it's pulling down at five pounds. Five um, pounds is a British un unit of, of, of uh, force, but the metric is, or the SI unit is, is um, the Newton so how many Newtons it's weighing there it says it's about nine Newtons so it's pulling down at nine Newtons well if it's not accelerating it must be zero so what's pulling up at nine Newtons All right you're gonna see there's tension in that spring that's why the scale is working the tension is pulling up with equal uh, force as the bag is pulling down if you've got a book on a table it is either falling through the table or not. If it's sitting on the table, then there must be a force up 
from the table equal to the force of gravity on that book going down. So if the, if the book is being shoved into the table by its weight, then there must be a force called the support force, also called the normal force. It's a 90 degrees to the surface of the table pushing back up on the book, equal and opposite to its weight, otherwise it would fall through the table. If you would have, I could imagine having something so heavy that if you put it on the table, it wouldn't just break the table. It would actually go through the table. Okay, if you put something ridiculously heavy on top of a table, it would probably crush everything, but it was most likely actually make a hole through the tabletop, okay? Because it's pushing down with a higher force, a net force, than the support force. But as long as there's a support force, you're gonna have equilibrium and it's not gonna move. So a lot of people don't understand the support force because you can't see it. You've got weight pushing down and it's not moving. So according to this idea of the equilibrium rule, there must be no net force on it, but yet gravity's there. There must be a backwards force that we can't see and that's the support force. The picture here of the spring might help you. The spring is pushing back, okay? Well, so is the tabletop. Okay, this is important and a lot of people miss this. Can you grab this concept? Equilibrium doesn't mean stopped. It just means not accelerating. So there's two possibilities. It could be stopped, all right? You've got a book on the table. The book is pushing into the table. The table's pushing up on the book and it's not moving. It's not accelerating. So it's in equilibrium. Well, you can have other things in equilibrium except something stopped. It just not accelerating. So imagine that I take a can of peas or whatever and roll it on my desk, okay? If the can is not accelerating, if it's just moving at a constant speed, then all of the, the weight of that can is rolling into the desk, down onto the desk, and the force of the table is pu pulling up on the can, so the can is not going into the table, it's just rolling across the table, and it just keeps rolling at a constant speed. So equilibrium can be two types. Static equilibrium is stopped, okay? All of the forces are opposed and the tug of war ropes is not moving. Dynamic equilibrium means, let's imagine you've got two teams on the flatbed truck going five miles an hour down the street and now they're tug of warring, okay? If they're perfectly balanced, there's no acceleration left or right, but the entire rope and both teams are, bo are moving, okay? So a can rolling across the table is in dynamic equilibrium, okay? The stupid idea with the teams on the flatbed truck pull tug of warring, that's in dynamic equilibrium. So this is just an example. If you push a box and it's not accelerating, it's going at a constant speed, it's still in equilibrium, okay? If you are, if it's, the box is simply sitting on the floor, it's also in equilibrium. The last guy we're gonna look at is Copernicus. Copernicus um, also basically said that Aristotle was wrong. Aristotle thought that the earth was uh, stopped and not moving and fixed, and that the stars and the planets moved in the in the sky above the above the earth the sun and the, all the planets and the stars all moved and the earth didn't he didn't feel it moving he didn't get car sick he didn't feel the wind blowing because the earth was moving a thousand miles an hour it felt like it was stopped copernicus said it doesn't match what i'm looking at he he had the concept if the earth were actually spinning on its axis then the stars would appear to move in the sky, the sun would appear to rise in the east and set in the west. All of this, all of this would make sense. He proposed, at great cost to himself, he published this book on his deathbed, by the way, because no one liked the idea that the earth was not the center of the universe, okay? So uh, most people didn't like it. They said, if the earth is moving, then the tree is moving. If the tree is moving, why doesn't it, why doesn't it whip the bird off the branch, okay? Or if I drop a ball at my feet and the earth is moving, why doesn't it fall at your feet? So a lot of people made fun of him and laughed at it, but what's happening is it not, it's not just the tree that's moving and the earth that's moving, it's the ball that's moving, okay? 
everything's moving. The bird stays on the branch because the branch is moving and the bird is moving and the earth is moving. All of it's moving and so it appears to us that nothing is happening, okay? So if you're on the school bus and you throw a coin up, in, up into the air, it's going, not gonna go into the back seat, okay, just because the bus is moving. It's gonna go up into the air and come back down into your hand because you're moving, the floor is moving, the coin is moving, all of it's moving forward. All right, hope that helps.